Thanks. Well, um, good morning, everyone. And I just want to thank you very much for joining us today. Um, you know, happy uh, International Women's Day week, I guess, early. Um, really happy to be able to have a conversation today with all of you. Um, you know, here in Alberta, we have a, a long legacy of women blazing trails for, for all those who follow them. And um, you think, take a look at somebody like um, Violet King Henry, you know, the first uh, black female lawyer in Canada, or Rosella Bjornsson, who I think was our first commercial pilot, you know, in North, I think in North America, maybe. Um, at any rate, to this day, our province, uh, the women in our province just continue to inspire me um, with their achievements. And um, I'm sure that's the same for you. I'm especially honored to meet with all of you today um, and recognize the incredible work that you're doing um, as business owners, academics, and leaders. Um, we've got some incredible panelists, so I just want to um, quickly introduce you to each other. Uh, we have Zara Guzari, uh, who's an assistant professor at the Department of Medicine and Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary, and an expert in combining research and clinical care to help Canada's elderly. So welcome, Zara. Thank we you. have Cindy Medinsky. She's the director of the Edmonton Events at Explore Edmonton, and that's incredible work that uh, makes a lot of people in our community very happy every day. We've got Alicia Namad Vasquez. Where are you, Alicia? There you are. Um, Assistant Professor of Robotics and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Calgary. It's just a fascinating field. And um, so I just want to welcome all of you, introduce you to each other, and we'll kick off uh, the discussion today by just uh, asking each of you to provide just a brief description of your journey as women leaders. And if you can just take um, like a couple minutes too to just uh, share a brief description of your personal and career paths and, and tell us a little bit about the person who inspired you as a woman in leadership. Zara, did you want to kick it off? Sure. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a physician here in Calgary. I'm a geriatrician, which means I specialize in the care of older adults. I actually did all my training here in Calgary and Alberta. Um, and uh, so I started here in undergrad and actually a new program at the time. Now it's over a decade old, but Bachelor of Health Sciences program. Uh, and then went into medical school and residency and all that. Throughout that time, I was fortunate to have many different mentors across uh, the University of Calgary and beyond. But uh, one person who I would say particularly influenced my leadership journey uh, is Dr. Holloway Baduke, who's our current department head. She was my supervisor for my master's degree, which I did during my fellowship training. And she was one of those people who sort of caught me off guard the first time when she was like, you know, you should really be a geriatrician. You're really good at this. And I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that as a career and just sort of really uh, that one question probably changed a lot of what I did. At the time, I thought I wanted to do something very different because my undergraduate work had been a lot of wet lab research. So, you know, cells and microscopes. And I was getting a bit frustrated with it because as I often joke, you can talk to the microscopes, they don't usually talk back to you. Um, and so I was getting a little frustrated with the bench research because it wasn't as engaging as I wanted it to be. I wanted to be working more with people. And she was somebody who did a lot of research uh, with people, patients, bedside uh, research. And I was like, oh, that's a thing. So it really did uh, change my life to meet that person. And she means, continues to be a leader and mentor for me uh, as well. Um, for myself, so as I mentioned, I'm a uh, associate, or sorry, uh, assistant professor here at the university, and I'm now the director for the Leaders in Medicine program, which are the students who uh, are doing graduate degrees and have been accepted into medicine. Um, I can certainly outline more of what I do around leadership and research, but uh, yeah. We'll definitely get you to dig into that uh, in the discussion. Thank you so much, Zara. Let's go to Alicia. Uh, hello. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very happy, very happy to be here. As, um, as, um, and as, as the introduction, I am assistant professor also at the University of Calgary working in uh, the, the Faculty of Architecture, Architecture, Planning and Landscape and uh, in the area of robotics and AI. And um, for me, like I'm trained as an architect, so I go to sleep as an architect, but I work uh, with robotics as a roboticist uh, all, uh, most of the time. And um, 
and, and something that um, kind of very um, inspired or, or my journey has been uh, through, through a kind of training in, in working in a, in a construction industry that is kind of very much male dominated and it's an industry that has that is not really has evolved uh, as fast as we as we would expect it to do. I'm originally from Mexico. I, I spent 20 years in London in the UK and I, I came to Calgary two years ago um, to join the university. So I'm very happy to be here and, and, and all the, the vibes and, and the kind of a change that are here. Um, person that I admire in my life uh, would be like a women uh, mentor, what would be like, uh, be like Saha Hadid, who was an architect uh, who kind of made me move uh, from, from Mexico into to London to the UK, where I, I wasn't expecting to spend so much time there. I was just going for a short period of time. I was just hoping to do my master's and ended up being there for, for like almost more than half of my life now. And, um, and it was like the idea of how we can like kind of really challenge construction and, and do more like innovative forms. And like, how did she manage to actually uh, in, uh, uh, introduce or introduce herself and, and get others to do her vision, right? In an industry that is so difficult for women to even be listened on the boardroom. And actually for me, that was something very inspirational. And also to, to discover how all of these uh, vision, larger vision is not like fancy forms, but it's actually geometry and shapes that are more performative and also could, could be better for, for, for the environment, more sustainable and bring so many benefits to, to what traditional construction or, or boxes that we usually do, do. So for me, uh, having like that, uh, like, uh, and then being able to work at her office for a few years was something uh, that I think really kind of, I started to mark my, my uh, or to, to inform my decisions into what do I want to do? How can I also kind of push the industry and try to do some things that could be uh, more innovative and sustainable and, and also try to get off in, 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 in this kind of field, which is like uh, even in, in, in Mexico, in the UK here, it's kind of a similar field is the construction industry. So that's what I work, that's what I do. And, and I think uh, she, she is one of the inspirational leaders and, and persons that I will really always admire and follow and, and, and left a very kind of amazing legacy of innovation and of vision in, in the world. And uh, yeah, so, so that's, uh, and, and that kind of marks my work mostly into like upskilling, training, and uh, trying to find new geometries and also how to build them. So I'm, more, I'm not focused so much on the design part, but on how we build these shapes in a way that is uh, inclusive and democratic and, um, uh, and uh, affordable, yeah. Wow, thank you, Alicia. There's lots to dig into uh, in uh, kind of the tech space that you were just chatting with us about. So we'll we'll dig into that in a second. Let's go to Cindy. Uh, tell us about who's inspired you and a little bit more about uh, yourself. Sure. Thank you so much for the opportunity to participate today. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm Cindy Medinsky, the director of Edmonton Events at Explore Edmonton. So we are a partnership between the city and explore Edmonton. And our mandate is to attract and support major sport and cultural events to the city. Um, so we, we do that in order to contribute to, you know, the economic prosperity of the region uh, in order to enhance Edmonton and Alberta's and Canada's global image and reputation. And as well, you know, we wanna provide opportunities for the community to, to be engaged and participate in sport and culture. Uh, as well as create lasting legacies uh, for that community. So um, it's something that I've always been passionate about, uh, you know, participating in sport as an athlete, um, but also as a coach and just seeing the incredible benefits that major events can bring to a community uh, in all different facets. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I think knowing that that was a passion of mine, um, I was very lucky you know, from the beginning of my career till now, to be influenced by a lot of different female leaders and female colleagues, all, all very positive, uplifting. Um, but one that stands out as early in my career uh, would be a woman by the name of Sheila O'Kelly. Uh, Sheila is uh, a huge ambassador for sport and, and recreation. Uh, she was the executive director uh, for the World Triathlon Series in Edmonton, um, an event that has roots in Edmonton's as far back as 1999. And it really was a true testament that this, this vision from this woman who emigrated from Ireland came here and, and had this vision for our city and for the sport to really grow. And just the incredible 
partnerships she's been able to create and relationships she's uh, been able to foster in the city, um, in Canada, and, and her reputation and, and just respect she's earned globally um, as a leader, as a female leader in sport, um, has been so inspiring. So she gave me my first opportunity in sport and sort of helped my career uh, flourish, I guess I could say. So um, I'm sure we'll get into it a lot more about Sheila and just sort of the, uh, you know, the, the things that she has been able to do. Um, but she has really um, spearheaded these, these sport initiatives and is a pillar of our community in, in that sense. So I'm uh, very grateful that she came into my life and inspired me to take this career path to, to keep building our community. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, you know, Associate Minister, I, I was just thinking we'll definitely need to follow up with all three individuals on the on the panel, because, you know, the the intersection of uh, sport with our, our ministry, and I know Associate Minister has a keen interest in sport, and as well as uh, supporting elderly women. So Zara, uh, thinking about, you know, how you could help us shape some of that for Associate Minister, as well as you, Alicia, Women in Tech. Uh, and really thinking about getting more women into the STEM fields is a, a key priority. So Associate Minister, do you have any uh, remarks that you'd like to kind of finish this opening part of the event and then we'll go into the dialogue? Yeah, I think you, I think you covered it pretty well, Kristen. There, there are some um, intersections of interest here because, um, well, personally, um, sport is, is incredibly important to me. I've been a sportswoman all my life and the most recent sport I played was actually women's tackle football. So it was trying to push the uh, the limits of uh, of uh, women in sport. You know, it was one of the last bastions of all male sports. So, um, and I just, you know, I have concerns about women returning to sport uh, after being off during the pandemic. I think we have some concerns there, and it's going to have health implications as well as um, mental health and, and community implications as well. And so trying to figure out how to inspire girls and women into sport and recreation um, for all of the great benefits that it provides. Um, women in STEM, I am concerned about because I feel like we, we made a lot of progress and I feel like we might be getting static or maybe even sliding a little bit backwards. That, that pipeline towards leadership in STEM is becoming narrow and narrower and more and more leaky. And I'm very concerned about that. And I think we really need to get on top of that because women are the backbone of our economy, frankly. And um, when we don't see women in, in certain industries and in certain sectors, we have a problem. And so we really need to address it. And then for elder women, you know, we actually, um, I have a parliamentary secretary, Jackie Lovely, who I'm really hoping we can um, connect Zara you with her, because her her whole um, purpose is to really um, help us address quality of life issues for elder women. Too often, elder women are left out of the whole conversation, and elder women have unique needs that are different from younger women. We all know that, and um, we need to be addressing um, these unique issues. And we also need to be addressing the fact that we've got um, certain um, deciles of, of women who are increasingly being left out of conversations because of the technological and digital divide. So there's lots going on there as well. So maybe you can, we can carry on this conversation. I'll let you guide it. I'm, I'm gonna try not to drive here, Kristen. <laughs> You can if you want, um, but certainly I think there's, you know, we've, we're we're well positioned to have a great conversation, and then we'll definitely follow up with each of you um, to kind of dive into each one of those uh, very interesting and well aligned with some of the stuff that we're working on here at Status of Women. Um, so just to dive into the dialogue, we do have about uh, I'm going to say what would that be 30 to 35 minutes just just to in, you know hear your insights i, I want to kick it off with a, a question that really is about you know your own self promotion so self promotion on uh, thinking about international women's day it's a really um, important day to really recognize uh, you know 
women leaders and then also yourselves and to take an opportunity to self-promote. So the first question really is about, you know, what I'll let you think about it for a, a few seconds, but like what is a key achievement in your leadership journey that you've had? So think about one achievement that you're particularly proud of. So I'll just give you a about 10 seconds to think about that and I'll uh, maybe get uh, Cindy to kick it off this time and then um, I'd also like you to build off of each other's uh, answers and and really keep this more of an informal dialogue I'll just make sure that I monitor participation as well I want to make sure each of you has an opportunity so Cindy what are what are you most uh, proud of in your leadership journey key achievement sure, sure thank you um this is, a, this is a tough one because I recognize, you know, I'm still very early in my career and there's a lot more to accomplish and learn. Um, but I would say this is a team and this is a, an initiative where I'm at today that I've wanted to be at since I um, had met Sheila. Um, and I remember applying for a role within Explore Edmonton specifically on sport event attraction fresh out of university, no experience, and didn't get the job. I know most people are saying this is a time to pump your, your tires, but I want to be honest too in that sometimes things don't always work out. So knowing that I wanted to be here, I, I thought, okay, what do I need to do in order to position myself um, to be one day the director of Edmonton events? So I took event jobs, worked in... Um, you know, the operational pieces, the, the marketing pieces, really worked my way up to get this experience and really tailored my, my resume and built my resume to one day be in this role. So fast forward five years later after uh, not getting the job, um, I had another opportunity to join the team and that was successful. Uh, I would say that's a huge accomplishment because it's now put, put me in a position to not only move forward on my passion, but really become a community leader and, and a, a builder. Um, another passion of mine and, and what I uh, went to school for uh, was international business and being able to communicate with, with people from all over the world uh, and, and talk about you know, our common goals as it related to sport and cultural event hosting. So I would say being one of the few women uh, in the international sport event hosting uh, world uh, in those international marketplaces uh, and sales missions, um, you know, being able to represent 50% of the population in an industry that is male dominated, um, I think was, was also a huge accomplishment for me. Uh, and through the time over these past five years at Explore Edmonton on the Edmonton events team, um, you know, I, I really used my position at, in and promoting Edmonton, I think, uh, very well and was recognized in 2020 as the uh, Canadian rising star in sport tourism. So I think that was a, a big accomplishment that really, um, really sort of ended an era on, on one end and is now catapulting me into sort of the next uh, level of leadership. So I know that was kind of all over the place, um, but that's sort of my story and, and my accomplishment so far. Not all over, not all over the place. Uh, I actually yeah. found that really quite compelling, just, uh, just so you know. Uh, sorry, Associate Minister, did you want to chime in? Okay. Um, just in terms of you know really overcoming like when you don't get something what do you do um i'm i'm pretty sure we all have one of those stories but also uh you know you're you're pretty humble because then you ended on the fact that you have an award around kind of being a rising star in in sport tourism which is fantastic so thanks so much for uh telling us your your journey cindy um let's go to zara and and maybe zara you can talk to us about one of your kind of key achievements that's very kind thank you um so yeah, I think that I think the most rewarding achievement as a leader is to have the students or, or people you work with kind of tell you how you may have helped or impacted them. And so I work with a lot of uh, undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate students at the University of Calgary. And uh, in that work, um, they nominated me for one of the leadership awards in our 
um, university uh, and also contributed to a nomination that the university was also putting forward for me to be one of the top 40 under 40 in Calgary this year or last year. And so uh, that was like a very rewarding experience because uh, they had sent me their reference or like their little letters afterwards. And, you know, you, you work with these students, I've worked with many of them for five plus years. And, you know, you think you, hopefully you think you've helped people and they've <laughs> gotten something out of it. But I think you don't always realize the impact that you've had on other people until you kind of hear it in their own words for these types of things. So that's probably the most rewarding thing is to have people really appreciate that you were, uh, a good mentor and, and somebody who helped them to you know achieve their own goals and I think that's the most rewarding thing personally um from a from that side of things thanks Zara and we do we do actually have a little segment of the dialogue today on paying it forward uh so we'll, we'll get you to circle back uh on that one uh kind of at the end of the conversation today Alicia uh you're up tell us about one of your biggest achievements um, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, that's like, uh, yeah, uh, I think that that's the biggest achievement and it's a bit difficult to kind of say like, well, this is like an achievement or something uh, and how, how does that change it? But I will say like something maybe like defining moments and uh, I will say like two, well, uh, four, three years ago, I'm a bit confused now, uh, when we built uh, Need Candela, which was one of the shells. So, so I was building, um, I was working in the UK for a long time and um, started my own company, my startup, Architecture Extrapolated. And we were just basically kind of really trying to merge this like a technology with traditional trades. And we were building a lot of, um, of, uh, of uh, pavilions and like concrete shells and like kind of basically new structures. And then in 2018, and there was an exhibition, the first exhibition ever of Zaha Hadid, which was this architect, right, that, that I kind of admired, first exhibition in Mexico City. And then they call me and they are like, Alicia, you know, um, we want to build like this shell, like it's a, it's a concrete shell, it's beautiful, it's quite big for the exhibition, can you build it? And, and I'm like, well, yes, of course I can. Of course, I have no idea how I'm going to do it. But of course, I mean, I have, I have built other shells before and I, and I know the traits and I know and I know the people and I, and I have worked in, uh, a lot on this before. So, so of course I can do it. And I just kind of really started to assemble a team, calling back some of the, of the like basically traits and, 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 and the kind of a master traits, uh, masons and the stuff that I knew before, like, can you work with me? We're going to do this innovative project, but now it's not just like a pavilion in a, in a plaza, now this is in the middle of a museum and it's going to open and it's going to be like this big international event. So we are on a tight deadline also. And I kind of assembled the team and I just basically kind of went, went um, stayed there for like um, two months in like kind of putting together a team, getting them all to work and really trying to coordinate. How can we build something when you have like the designers are in London? I was also in London, but I was coordinating a team in Mexico. And then we have the, 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 the engineers are the ETH in Zurich. So I like this kind of very high precision Swiss people that really want everything to kind of very high degrees of precision. And then we need to merge the technology and this high technology that they are working on with the traditional crafts and ways of building, right? And we're also talk, talk, talking about like cultures where maybe some concepts are different. And um, so, so it was like a very kind of um, interesting collaboration and we're trying to, to manage this. And, and then like, um, so we just went on site and I just kind of put together a team. We built it, uh, we, we managed to successfully build, build, build the shell, which was like, I said, it was a big structure was there, like maybe five by five meters. And something for me very fascinating was first, like now I, I was on the same level, right? As, as before I was like an employee, but now my startup is actually been working with some of the kind of more important offices of architecture. And, and, I'm, and I'm the lead of that startup and they are calling me to work with them and, and, and to build a, a concrete shell that they are actually relying as, as the main piece for an exhibition that is coming. So for me, that was a very kind of uplifting moment and, and also like the huge responsibility that I had. And, and we did finish, we finished on time actually, like two days before schedule, but the shell was beautifully built there. Even the exhibition wasn't finally totally mounted. So, so, so it was like a very kind of a nice moment, but also like by being there and working with the trades and I already had a lot of this interest into how can we merge like this very high-end technology with the trades. And, and for me, something also very fascinating was like I was on site for two months. I left my house. I was just in Mexico all the time for two months um, just building the, 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 the thing, the, the pavilion. And um, working with it, with it, with it, like I was working with the technology part, 
But uh, and then as so when I was with the trades and like getting very much engaged with all of the builders and they were like and and they were telling me like you know what we're always doing the same stuff we're always building the same like 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 buildings right they were so excited to say like well we really like working with you and this was like the third shell that I had already built like the third concrete concrete shell structure I had built in Mexico and they were like we really like working with you architect because we do we do different things so like for me it was like a realization that. A lot of people kind of say, well, you know, the construction industry is outdated, no one wants to move on, blah, 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 blah. But actually there is a spirit and, and, they, and there's so much excitement of doing new things and different things. And, I, and, they, and like a lot of the time we had to like, um, to like work late and they will be like, uh, I mean, of course, it was all fully, fully paid and fully compensated, but they will be like, yeah, yeah, we, we, they, there was the excitement of saying we stay because we want to learn. We want to do this. This is something that we don't do. We're always just doing the same, you know, columns, slabs, boring stuff. So, so it was like... It, it was like very fascinating to actually see how this can permeate and really kind of have an impact on, on, on like kind of everyone involved on the project from like the kind of we have the engineers in Zurich and the high level architects in like in like London to like even all the trades and everyone that was uh, through the construction process was, was like a very kind of exciting moment. And I think that after we finished the shell, it really kind of changed my, my a lot of, of my direction and my approach into how can we actually democratize this technology, bring it to, to the construction side, involve more people, upskill, reskill, like uh, women, um, men, people that will be interested. So it kind of really made me realize of, of how this curiosity and how this interest kind of really go, goes, goes a long way. And it's not something that I'm just dreaming and I'm just thinking that is exciting, but actually it does excite a lot of people and, and, and it's valuable. So, so it was a very, very interesting moment. And then from there, like I came to Calgary and just kind of we are just working on, on these projects of like uh, of, of like uh, engaging with trade and, and democratizing technology, uh, making accessible, affordable, and uh, for, for allowing them to build like faster, cheaper, more efficiently. So, so I think that that was like a very, very interesting moment. And also like like suddenly when, when you see that, that, that you are kind of at the same level or, or on the same discussion table as people that you all admire, it's kind of empowering. And, 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 and sometimes you just, uh, for me, it was sometimes very difficult to believe. Like, like I was like, mm, I, I, I'm the correct person. Maybe are they confused? Is it really me? But then it was me. So, so it, it, it's kind of exciting in a, in a weird way. Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, there's so much to unpack uh, just in terms of your key achievements, working internationally across cultures, leveraging teams. Uh, and, the, I, you know, I'm interested in, you know, your thoughts on the democ democratization of, of the spaces that you build and, and the tech. So very fascinating. I, we'll move to the next question. Um, you know, going back to where we kind of landed before I asked you about your key achievement, which is, you know, um, we're definitely in the status of women file. I know associate ministers leading a lot of different uh, topics and, and different initiatives, including um, some stuff on women in STEM, women in tech, uh, you know, women in sport, uh, supporting elderly women. So I thought we could actually uh, split this question two ways, if you don't mind. So, you know, the first part of it is, is what can the government of Alberta do to support emerging women leaders? So if you want to think about that one, just so a broad question about like, how can we support emerging women leaders? And then the second part is, is if you have ideas for us around, like, what could the government of Alberta do to support, for example, Cindy, women in sport or women in tourism, uh, however you want to kind of split that for me. Uh, and same with you, Zara, what, what can we do to support elderly women uh, from your from your perspective and Alicia uh, what can we do to support women in STEM so I'll just give you a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to think about all of that uh, before we dive in we'd just love to really kind of get your perspective on that and and help us shape uh, some of our thinking I, I think certainly that that would be helpful for for the associate minister and myself so maybe uh, this time uh, we'll start with you again Zara how about you kick it off yeah, sure. I'm just trying to think of the best way. I think for supporting emerging women leaders, um, I don't know how the best way to put this is. I mean, I think the, the key thing is is having those opportunities presented to them in a way. And I know that's not easily achieved at a governmental level, right? Because a lot of these uh, roles are at much uh, different levels. And so in a, in a way, I mean, I think the opportunities I've had are because my, my mentors and those around have had that sort of push and pull. Uh, 
version of leadership, or at least that's the way they, you know, have described it to me, right? Those above us have to pull in order to get some of us up, right? Um, so I feel like there has to be more of that at the higher level, uh, for, and I work in university, so that would be the focus I have, is, is having that understanding that those things need to change, right? So like, I see some people who've been in roles for a very, very long time, um, and perhaps those roles should have, you know, terms, right? So the roles are, you know, being finished and other people are being considered versus person staying in a role for, you know, 20 plus years as a leader and thus not opening up for new opportunities. And so, you know, in a way it's, it's, it's I don't know that the, um, government can change those things, but I, I feel like there's something to be said about having that type of leadership training and demonstration to major institutions so that there is that idea, like what is equitable leadership and how do we make sure that that's happening and what are those principles and whether that's education or principles that would be supported, you know, by the uh, Office of the Status of Women, you know, like those kinds of things, you know, the more the universities and other organizations are adhering to those, the better they're off if they're able to adhere to that kind of thing. Um, so sorry, I spent a lot of time thinking about that first question. What was your second question? It was about women, older women. <laughs> yeah, any ideas that you have uh, okay. for us regarding, like, how could the government of Alberta support elderly women? I, I think, uh, so in the space I work, I, I work uh, in a lot of patient-engaged research and patient-partner research, and that's one area that I would say is really important to encourage older women, um, because they have a lot of lived experience that they can contribute. Um, and I see that as an example of where our government and research has done a good job of that is in the strategic clinical networks where we have um, patient partners as part of research. And I think encouraging older women to do that type of thing is really important. Um, I think a lot of, uh, I would say this in general, maybe this is, I think overall women underestimate our ability, right? Like we tend to d defer to, oh, I don't know if I can do that versus uh, I feel like my male colleagues are more like, yeah, I could probably do that, you know, <laughs> whether or not the experience is there. And so I, I see that. In, in older women when I'm asking if they want to participate as, as a researcher on the team or as a, a person to provide that experience. And I think there's a lot to be said about encouraging people to do those and opening up those opportunities. I think those are the challenge. I think a lot of people, especially the patient population I see, which are mostly retired, but certainly many are still working, uh, don't see that they can do it, right? It's, it's a different generation. They don't see that they can do it, so they're not going to, to come forward with that. If you ask them to volunteer to participate as a person in research, that often um, is, is a low threshold and people will, will participate, but to, to lead along with you, I think is a, often that sort of initial bar of, oh, I don't know, I don't have training, I've never done this. And I think that's um, unfortunate because as uh, the associate minister said, we lose out on a lot of experience that women have that can be extremely important uh, to, you know, moving ourselves forward, right? As uh, experience that's lost if they don't share it in a way. Can I ask a question just yeah. to dig into that a little bit? So um, you were speaking about um, having, a, you know, the, the women in leadership um, piece promoted in post-secondary, it sounded like. Yeah. Do you think we should be doing more to write it into the K-12 curriculum? Should we oh, be absolutely. earlier? I would then, love that. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I wonder if there's programming we could design an offer for older women to give them a bit of a an upskilling, if you will, on yes. leadership skills so that maybe that'll give them a little bit more confidence. Because I think, you know, if you take a course in something, you realize, well, I already knew how to do this. But you almost need to take the course for it to tell you what you already knew. I 100% agree with both of those. I think there really needs to be a lot more push in K to 12 around understanding what leadership is, A, and B, that women can do that. And it doesn't have to just be in the house, um, right? And I would say the same, I absolutely think having, you know, some training or a course for older women would be great. I mean, I was just in a panel, a grant panel yesterday, which we were fortunate enough to have lots of patient partners participate. And you know, they asked us all to introduce ourselves. And the first thing some of these older women are saying, well, I've never done this before, so I don't know if I'm doing it right. You know, like, and it's like, no, no, you're gonna do fine. Like, you can do this. And um, they did great, right? They did an amazing job. And at the end, again, the usual, like you just said, oh, that wasn't so hard, you know, <laughs> you know I knew what I was doing. Um, but like, it's, it's almost like that instinctual, we have to undercut what we're gonna do before we do it uh, in that sort of societal, I don't know what the right word is for that, that like pressure we have to do to undercut ourselves so we don't seem, arrogant or whatever the right word is. 
Um, so I really think there's a lot we can do there uh, for women. I, I think I was fortunate in my K to 12 um, uh, to be in a smaller school that really encouraged young girls into leadership and like had us join and, you know, prefects and different things and lead and exciting things like your book. But I mean, those things make a difference in the long run, right? Uh, even if it is small at the time. You know, I definitely saw uh, lots of nodding uh, as Zara was chatting there. Um, you know, we could we could actually just uh, go to Alicia and ask a similar question around, you know, is does there need to be more support in the curriculum for women in STEM here in in government of Alberta? Uh, kind of thinking about like that leaky pipeline that associate minister talked about. How do you how do you support young girls to think about women in STEM? Uh, and then you can tell us about your other ideas that you have, Alicia, as well. I just think I saw some nodding uh, going on around you know cur the curriculum for for the elementary and high school. Um, but yeah, you can tell us kind of your broad ideas about how, how can we support emerging women leaders. So I'll hand it over to you, Alicia. Yeah, thank you, Chrissy. No, it was because like uh, when Zara, I, I totally agree with what uh, she was saying on like kind of upskilling and kind of really like, like she was mentioning that like, just, bringing, just bringing the technology or just bringing the things to women, right? And, and that's basically like just when she said, just bring it to them. I, I think I fully agree on that. And, uh, and, 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 and I mean, the, the idea of like upskilling or reskilling um, is something that, that we are kind of really looking at. And I think that when we talk about uh, technology or especially like uh, when we talk about um, like the, the technologization, for example, or how can we are introducing more technology into the construction industry, we normally kind of think about uh, big factory right upside where, where like people just go and work like, like, like uh, but if we actually look at it from like the small scale, how do we actually, instead of saying, okay, yeah, like to, to make this with more technology, we just have to make it into, into a factory and just it's a detached process that becomes far away from, from us. Like if we bring technology into the site, in, into, into people's hands, into women's hands, and then we can just like, um, like, you know, here are the robots, here are the machines, we're going to teach you how to use them to do processes. It becomes a very tangible, tangible thing and you, and you can very kind of quickly start working with them. I think especially now, like, and with women and, and men, like especially like younger, when, when they have like a, a lot of like video games and, and a lot of this kind of tech already embedded in a way. So like training to use robotics and to use these machines also, uh, it's, it's a lot easier. So it should be definitely introduced um, kind of maybe high school, but also for women that maybe now are looking for like reskill or to like kind of find new skills and also, like if, if there are lots of things that I cannot do, right? That are maybe like lifting kind of heavy materials and these things. But if I have a robot doing that for me, then I can do the other task on, on, um, on, 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 uh, on, on the building process. So I think that, uh, that, that the, when we kind of think about, um, and that's where I talk, talk about like democratization of the technology is like kind of embedding technology at the smallest scale as to as try to just take over some tasks that are collaborative to 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 the to the adjacent tasks on a, on a, on a, on a construction side or on a construction on, a, on an architectural project on the building so like so so the machines will do some parts of it but then there is still a lot of skills to operate the machines first and then to to do the complementary actions it's not like the machine will do everything either and i think that there is a big opportunity for bringing basically these skills and and and, and this kind of a certification or training programs where it's more like a digital digitization of construction on a small scale as opposed to just the big big warehouses and things that are basically out of reach for for a lot of people it's it's, it's uh, either you are a worker there or you are the owner but, but whereas in a, in like a small scale there is more um more um factibility of more people being able to be participating on a on a democratized construction industry and and digitized so that so, so I do totally agree like upskilling reskilling and also bringing bringing the machines out of the big factories and actually just making them part of the process. And, and that, that's processes that we are working on developing. And, and we, love to, we would love to kind of choose them for, for training. I find that really interesting, this concept of bringing the technology out of this sort of perceived alien environment. Um, and I think that actually links into a little bit of what we were talking about with Zara and elderly women as well, where there's there's a divide there where I think people are almost afraid of it a little bit because they they don't have the daily touch and feel experience with it. 
And I think robotics is actually a really interesting field in that it does have touch and feel to it. You know, it's less um, virtual, if you will. Um, I think there's, I think there's really something to that. Just bringing it into people's hands, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think like with uh, with robotics, we can like take them out of their cages, as we say, and just bring them. And, and also they are like a very flexible, nice machine that we could train on using them. And, and it can like, if a robot is lifting the heavy pieces for you, you can still do all the uh, weldings, all the, etc. You can do all the adjacent process, right? Where maybe women get a bit excluded because yeah, you cannot live the same thing, right? That's that's logical. But then if the, if the robot is doing that, you can still be part of the process as, as opposed to just be excluded of the whole process, which, yeah. For sure, like, uh, I, I love that concept of just bringing something out and allowing people to kind of experiment and get to get used to it, learn it. I noticed Zara had, you had your hand up, so I'll let you uh, chime in and then we'll go to you, Cindy. Zara? Interesting, uh, like Alicia said, there's a lot we can do with uh, technology, robots, et cetera, in older adults. And there's a lot being explored in this area. Even those living in long-term care who are, you know, are potentially most sick and frail persons, we're looking at how we can use robotics as part of social interaction and other other aspects. We already do it in the children's. I don't know if you guys have seen in the children's hospital, they have this like happy little robot that distracts the kids before procedures and you can like program it with their favorite song and it's like super cool. Anyway, um, so there's a lot that's done in health with robots, but I, I think the same goes about supporting people at home. And so exactly what Alicia is saying, I'm forgetting the name of the uh, gentleman I met in architecture who was looking at the laneway homes and the, and the adaptive technology within those to support older women and men uh, at home. And there's so much there that I think we can do that helps people to live in place and in the long run is better for them. So it's, I just, I concur and I think it's great. Thanks, Zara. Cindy, tell us about your ideas on how government of Alberta could support emerging leaders. And then, uh, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts on sport, tourism and events. Sure. Well, I think, uh, you know, sessions and, and roundtables like this is such uh, an amazing step forward, allowing the opportunity for all of us to to talk about these topics openly uh, is is incredible. And I think more opportunities like that and not only, um, you know, just just female panels and sessions. I know that can sometimes be more comfortable, but, you know, I really what Zara was saying about sort of our, our internal need to, you know, dim ourselves a little bit um, and just that innate, that innate uh, urge to just check and cut down what we're, we're trying to say and who we're trying to be and, and how we're representing. Um, so I think opportunities to have male and female discussions and panels and have, and have women at the table um, with those conversations alongside men, doing more of that, uh, is important. So I do really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is a, a great step forward. Um, you know, as far as women in sport uh, and tourism, I mean, sport in particular, kind of overarching, I think there was a study that came out that said one in four Canadian girls will not return to sport after the pandemic, which is so disappointing. And I think, you know, people are taking note of that and trying to find ways to encourage you know, women and girls to, to continue to play. Um, you know, we certainly want to be able to do that through our event attraction initiatives and, um, you know, supporting projects that have like a, a girls only component or, you know, a women's tournament and, and really highlighting that and having that a key piece of projects moving forward. Um, there's, there's not a lot that we are bringing through these days um, that, are just, you know, only male dominated. It, it might be from the pro sport perspective that it's it's the men, but there needs to be, you know, that EDI lens and the and the women's component in that. So that's our goal when we are are working, you know, with any events rights holders or or promoters coming through. Um, you know, going back to that pro teams piece, like just seeing the discrepancy, we're, we're putting so much money you know, corporately, especially into these men's leagues. Like we're, we just had the Canadian Elite Basketball League, you know, come to fruition in 2018. And that's great, but it's all men. You know, the CFL has so many strong roots in Canada, but, you know, Associate Minister, when you were saying tackle football, I thought, yes, like 
there's no female pro sports leagues in Canada, right? And you're seeing that the U.S. make strides forward, but young girls need to see themselves in these women playing in sport, not just the men. And obviously the men help, you know, pave the way, but there needs to be more emphasis put on, on women in sport, not only at the grassroots level, but at a, a high performance level as well. Um, when I kind of switching gears to tourism, um, I think over 50% of employees within tourism are, are female. So that's really great to see. But when I look at my senior leadership team, for example, four out of five of those leaders are men. So you can see that it's, it's hard to make that jump to that senior, you know, executive office level, I think as a woman, even though the majority of the, you know, the industry is, is female, um, is made up of females. I mean, it is great though, that we do have a, a female CEO. I think that is uh, a huge win and a, a huge step forward as well. Um, and I think just on, and I think both uh, Alicia and, and Zara touched on this, but I think sort of that education and training um, piece is important. I've heard a lot that technology is a gap for a lot of women. So, you know, providing more training opportunities and sort of female entrepreneurship, um, you know, initiatives, I think is important. You know, we, in Edmonton, we're seeing a lot of of uh, local businesses that are female led and that's so incredible and I think being able to to see more of that um, you know as we're recovering from the pandemic uh, is is a good thing. Can I ask a really kind of difficult question maybe? To what extent do we think that we might be seeing a lot of uptake in women's entrepreneurship because women have sort of abandoned ship on their way to leadership in larger um, business and corp. Yeah, I think that's uh, an incredible comment. I, um, I, I, had, I had chills because it brings me to sort of the personal side and how like childcare, for example, is, is a huge one. And I think female entrepreneurs, they can build their own schedules because they have, they have to now. You know, the, the regular nine to five doesn't necessarily always work when you're trying to balance work and you know your your home life and in most cases being the primary caregiver and it's yeah it's a lot so I think that's pushing women um okay. as well in addition to you know maybe the the inability to get to that that executive office level um but I think the flexibility and you know in the work day is part of it as well what do you think, Alicia and Zara? Because you, you know, Zara, in your field in STEM, you've got a great number of women in in the biosciences, medical sciences. Alicia, probably fewer women in the AI tech piece, perhaps, than you would see in uh, in uh, bi the biosciences. Do you think? Um, do you think there is? Uh, we know that the women don't, women don't end up in leadership as often as men. We keep seeing it over and over again. We know the pipe is leaky. Do we think that women, like, there are women that will choose to leave for, and pivot for various reasons, whether it be child, child care, or perhaps they're, you know, sandwiched with uh, child care and elder care, um, those sorts of things. Um, is it just really women are just naturally more entrepreneurial and just gravitate towards that? Or is there a certain amount of abandoning ship? I don't know, um, because women perhaps don't, they don't see themselves at the next, they don't see themselves in the next level. They don't see people like them at the next level. Um, thoughts on that, Elisa and Zara? I feel like um, in, in, in my field, I see a lot of women take a, a part-time role, for example, like they'll decrease their full-time. So we're, our contracts are all based on like a 1.0 full-time. I see people decrease that because of care needs for family, whether that's children or older adults or, you know, feeling like they need more time and space, but they still work more than full-time, right? So they're just getting paid less uh, to work full-time. I see that a lot. Um, there's a lot of people who are, again, like I said earlier, approached for leadership or, or even, you know, differing roles in this, like I said, this 
notion that I don't have enough training for that, or I need to do more, or I can't possibly take that on. Uh, so that sort of deference or, or maybe, I don't want to say lack of encouragement, but maybe just they don't feel they can, even though they for sure could. And so, uh, and I think along with that, there's often a lot of lack of support for some of those, those, those roles. And um, there does need to be, I mean, some experience and stuff before you take on leadership roles, because that's, I think, the other flip side, is I've also seen very junior female um, persons come on being put into a higher up leadership role, and they weren't quite ready, and then they don't have the support, and then they turned off from it forever, right? And so I think there's, like, kind of both. I don't feel like it's, uh, you know, we're more entrepreneurial. I feel like it's, like, well, why would I persist in this area that's toxic, or or people are not listening or don't, they don't value, I might as well go work for myself at least. Like, <laughs> then my company's good and I don't have to deal with, you know, some of these other things. I can imagine that happening for a lot. Um, and I, I don't see that the same as, a, as an academic. I think there's a lot, as you mentioned in the biosciences, there's a lot more females, but um, as you mentioned, especially in medicine, like more than 50% of my class is women, but that's not the breakdown leadership across all of the pillars, right? And I apply for lots of research funding in which I'll see, you know, the final results and it's very few women or of color or, you know, things like that. It tends to de default to a category that is well-funded, right? And so those things are frustrating. And over time, I can understand why people just give up and move on to do something else, because why would you persist, right? If you just continue to not be able to afford. I do see a lot of change there. And like I said, a lot of pull a lot of support, but it doesn't change overnight, right? These these processes are not without bias. And I think that's and thus we don't uh, move forward. Alicia? Yeah, yeah, just to comment on that, like I actually like uh, now with what Zara said, it becomes a lot more interesting. Like uh, because I do have the, the opposite situation that, that what Zara has. Like when I kind of show my my when I present my class and, and people kind of see it about like architecture, but in technology, uh, I get most of the male students as opposed to the female students. I get very little of them. So that kind of starts to be troubling. Like like from a very early on, that kind of women will kind of pivot towards more theoretical or like more kind of philosophical kind of parts as opposed to the practical application of tech and, and I mean for me that's like the future right so so it's a bit of a disappointment when I see that I do I do think that we are in a very interesting moment in terms of like coming out of the pandemic how are we going to react to, to going back into 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 the office or the working area because this thing of flexibility has been the and I fully agree with what has been mentioned before has been kind of holding back women for a long time because like yeah you have to pick up kids I have to pick up my kid from school and nurseries and, and a childcare or this and that and, and and it does kind of put constraints that but now we discovered that we can work from home, that we can work remotely, that these things work. So, so that that we could actually have this flexibility, right? And and that Zoom, we everyone hates Zoom, but still, we also discovered that that it does work. So, I think that it's an interesting. Um, I don't know, like like coming out of the, of the pandemic, are, uh, how are, how the government will kind of or, or kind of spearhead these two offices? Like, is it that everyone is just about going back to real time, or actually the flexibility could kept being encouraged. I know that right now people are still taking a soft approach into inviting people to come to the office. Will that last forever? Or is there going to be come to the point where you have to be there? And I think that if we normalize, or it really starts to be like a more hybrid approach, as opposed to like, if you're not in the room, you're in the menu, like they used to say, or like, you know, so like, and people kind of feeling forced to be back in the real life, but actually kind of keeping this idea of flexibility. I think that will be very helpful for mainly for women or for me at least I see that that's a point where like it could be a turning point and and, and kind of start to encourage more women because I believe the flexibility and the other commitments in the corporate ladder are, 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 are a problem especially when companies used to be very offer very little or not flexibility at all. Thanks Alicia. So we're just uh, right at the almost at the end of our time together. I thought I'd just throw out one last question uh, before Associate Minister does her closing remarks. You know, uh, just on the same kind of theme around, you know, challenges getting into leadership. Um, I was wondering, you know, where you see yourself in the next decade. What do you aspire to, to achieve? Um, 
you know, you talked a little bit about your key achievements already, but where do you, where do you see yourself in the next decade? So Zara, uh, and then we'll go to Cindy and Alicia, I'll give you the last word. We'll have to be quick because uh, we're running out of time, but Zara, you go first. Yeah, I think for myself, from a leadership perspective, I'm more focused on leadership within research in the university and uh, trying to build upon the profile there for, for women in leadership, as well as clinician scientists, as I mentioned. Um, and I think that's sort of where I see myself going as far as leadership versus, you know, clinical or administrative leadership on the, the other side or education. Cindy. Uh, I would say um, I see myself on the same path and, and with the same sort of um, specialist focus on you know, sport development and sporting events. Um, I think just going back to the point about why are women leaving and starting their own businesses and becoming those female entrepreneurs? Um, I don't know if I see myself at an executive level because at that stage, your scope is, is obviously broadened and you don't have the ability to make the same, I think, uh, incremental change that you do when you're, you're doing the work and you're, you're on the ground. So um, I don't know if I will still be <laughs> in the same organization, but uh, I definitely in sport and encouraging, um, you know, Edmonton, Alberta and Canada uh, to be a, you know, an amazing sport hosting destination. Alicia. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I'm definitely kind of uh, working or, or what I see myself is we are trying uh, working on developing these kind of uh, factory in a box, what I call like a, like a container with like the robots and, uh, and being able to bring that out of, of the cages, bring it to site and have a, like a upskilling, micro credentials kind of programs adjacent to that to be able to really kind of see how, how can we engage with a broader public and in, in STEM, in technology, in the construction industry. And, and, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would like to have these factories deployed around and seeing robots everywhere on the city soon building things. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. This was absolutely a fascinating conversation. I definitely enjoyed it. I'll hand it over to you, Associate Minister, for closing remarks. I just want to I just want to thank you so very, very much for sharing your time today. I think it's um, absolutely wild that we've got women in three very disparate fields who have who share many of the same concerns and potential solutions and and um, observations it's really quite something um i'm really fascinated by kind of where we got to today um and now my next step is going to be try to figure out how the government can really support where we need to go um i want to really invite you you know if you um have an aha moment in the middle of the day or perhaps in the middle of the night feel free to, to shoot me a note because I'd really love to hear um, ideas that you have. I really feel like we are very, to Alicia's point, we really are at a turning point right now. We've, we've come through a, a terrible time for the last two years, but it's also shown us some opportunities, I think, um, to change. It's you know shone a light on many things and it's giving us an opportunity to see what kind of change is actually possible and um, I think we can make a really big difference. Um, but we need more women in leadership. We know we do. Um, but it's interesting to think about, you know, even just what Cindy had just said about, I don't know if I wanna be in the same organization at the leadership level years from now, maybe I want to be doing something completely different, but in the same sort of field, you know? So I think it's really, um, I think that's a really interesting observation, actually. Um, and Zara, it would be really cool to understand from your from your uh, clients that you deal with and your students, how do they see that from the perspective of being that 10 years or 20 years down the road and maybe looking backwards and going, well, if I was going to do it differently, I would have done this, knowing what I know now. And I think sharing that knowledge is so really, really important. It would be great to be able to get those stories really out there in front of people so they can, you know, have that perspective as well. But thank you so much for spending time today. I really, really appreciate it. And happy International Women's Day. Keep on going. Girl power and uh, women power. 
I'm really um, so very pleased that you shared your time to with me today. Thank you.